Chapter 18 is going to focus on eating and feeding disorders. This is probably the most complex and potentially lethal psychiatric disorder. The mortality rate for eating disorders is high, and so is the risk for suicide among this population. Treatment is gonna focus on normalizing eating patterns and beginning to address the issues raised by the illness. So let's get started here. As far as clinical picture, we're gonna talk about these three. Um, anorexia nervosa. Anorexia are people that refuse to maintain minimal normal weight for height. These individuals have an intense fear of gaining weight. They have distorted body image and they really restrict their calorie. Bulimia um, are individuals that engage in repeated episodes of eating large quantities of food over a short period of time called binge eating, followed by an inappropriate comp compensatory to get rid of the excessive calories these behaviors may be self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, diuretics, fasting, or excessive exercise. Self-image is largely influenced by body image. And then binge eating are individuals that engage in repeated episodes of eating large quantities of food over a short period of time, but they don't follow up with the inappropriate behaviors and inevitably become obese. These episodes induce guilt, depression, embarrassment, or disgust. So let's talk about each of these individually. So the first one we're gonna talk about is anorexia nervosa. Individuals have, again, that intense fear of gaining weight. There is a misperception that individuals with anorexia refuse to eat despite being hungry. However, evidence shows us that they, um, experience significant difference is in sensation of taste, appetite, and satiety. These unique unpleasant uh, sensational um, sensations help to perpetuate the disorder, leading to restriction and sometimes purging. In order for diagnosis of anorexia nervosus, individuals must meet the DSM-5 criteria which include restricting um, energy intake to below requirements, significant loss of weight and malnutrition, um, intense fear of weight gain or persistent interference with weight gain, disturbance of body image, and self-evaluation linked to body weight or shape. As far as epidemiology, the estimated lifetime prevalence is about 0.5% that do not represent, uh, is about 0.5%. That really does not represent the actual prevalence. Uh, fewer than half seek help and individuals tend to conceal their symptoms. It commonly begins during adolescence or in young adult. The median age of onset is about 18. It is more common among females than males, um, but regardless of gender, um, disordered eating is more common among athletes that participate in sports that emphasize aesthetic or leanness. So sports like running, gymnastics, wrestling, or figure skating have high incidences. There is also a higher incidence among individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or um, queer slash questioning um, or LGBTQ. Um, population. Some of the risk factors, um, biological factors, researchers have found that genetic correlations between anorexia, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, OCD, and schizophrenia. They also found a correlation between anorexia and variations in glucose and lipid metabolism. The neurotransmitter tryptophan is essential to serotonin synthesis and is available only through diet. A normal diet boosts serotonin in the brain and regulates mood. Declines in dietary tryptophan may actually relieve symptoms of anxiety and dysphoria and provide reward for calorie restriction. 
The cycle of temporary relief sets up a positive feedback loop that reinforces the disordered eating. As far as cognitive factors, anorexia is an egocentonic disorder. That means individuals value their disorder. Although they know their actions are potentially harmful, they believe that the benefits outweigh the harm. As far as environmental, anorexia is associated with cultures that value thinness. So characteristics of anorexia nervosa, nervosa can include um, being preoccupied with food and the rituals of eating, along with voluntary refusal to eat. This typically starts most often in females from adolescent to young adult. We've kind of talked about that. The onset can be associated with stressful life events. Remember, they have a fear of obesity. They are terrified of gaining weight. They feel fat even when they're thin. Their perception is that they are severely overweight and sees the image reflected in the mirror. They have a loss of at least 25% of their original body weight. ATI states that the patients are less than 85% of their expected normal weight. That's the number I would probably remember. Refusal to maintain body weight. Um, and with females, they will have some amenorrhea, so loss of their menstrual cycle. We also need to remember to self-assess. Nurses tend to believe that behaviors are self-imposed where the patient views these behaviors as essential to their security and safety. I want you to think about what makes you feel safe, comfortable, and in control, and then imagine being asked to give it up. That's what we are asking um, our anorexias to do if we don't self, if we're not self-aware. As far as assessment guidelines, we want to look at the patient's perception of the problem or chief complaint. We want to perform a complete nursing assessment, including vital signs, review of system, looking at appearance. We want to gather a psychosocial history and screen for suicide or self-harm behaviors. We're going to assess um, nutritional and fluid intake, assess daily activities, and then review some lab, lab testing, um, which might include electrolytes, glucose, thyroid function, CBC, EKG, CPK. Um, those would be some big ones. After a thorough assessment, prioritization is going to kick in, and it's going to include impaired nutritional status, maybe impaired cardiac output, electrolyte imbalance, disturbed body image, ineffective coping, low self-esteem, and even powerlessness. So as far as outcomes, those are gonna be patient-centered. And again, we're just focusing on those prioritization and making those goals um, to be better. So improved nutritional intake, cardiac output, electrolyte balance and fluid balance, positive body image, effective coping, positive self-esteem. As nurses, we need to plan um, for refeeding syndrome. So refeeding syndrome um, are when nutrients are restored. Insulin stimulates glycogen, fat, and protein synthesis, which is a process that requires minerals such as phosphate and magnesium. In severely malnourished patients, a refeeding syndrome can occur. This is potentially lethal and can be a complication because of a result in fluid balance abnormalities, abnormal glucose metabolism, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, <laughs> sorry, and hypokalemia. Thiamine deficiency can also occur. So what can we do? We need to reintroduce nutrients slowly to avoid this syndrome. We can consult with a dietitian. To, to develop a reintroduction of nutrients so that they are given slowly during that initial treatment period. We can monitor blood electrolytes and administer fluid replacements. Treatment for anorexia may occur as inpatient, day treatment programs, or even outpatient environments. And we're going to make sure we're checking first for any suicidal ideation um, that's our first plan of treatment always. Um, psychosocial interventions may occur, pharmacotherapy may occur, psychotherapy, nutrition, health teaching, and promotion 
and then safety and teamwork are all interventions that we can utilize. As far as treatment modalities, biological treatments include pharmacotherapy. Research really doesn't support the use of pharmacological agents to treat the core symptoms. Um, psychotropic medications can be utilized to treat associated symptoms or other co-occurring disorders. Um, some of these medications may be your SSRIs, anti-anxiety, second generation antipsychotics, or even mood stabilizers. Integrative medicine may include yoga, massage, acupuncture, um, light therapy, psychological therapies, um, insight-oriented individual therapy, adolescent focus therapy, family therapy, and CBT. All of those are done by your advanced practice nurse. So let's move into bulimia. Bulimia is binge eating repeatedly followed by inappropriate compensatory behaviors such as self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, fasting, excessive exercise. Characteristics of bulimia nervosa um, include a weight within a normal range or slightly higher. So this is a normal looking appearing patient as they walk through the door. Um, average onset or age of onset is late adolescent or early adulthood. It usually occurs in females. Between binges, patient typically restricts calorie intake and selects low calorie diet type foods. DSM-5 criteria for diagnosis includes recurrent episodes of binge eating, recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors, both occur on average at least once a week for about three months. Um, Self-evaluation is undue, um, duly influenced by body shape and weight, and disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexics. So what are some of the risk factors? We can talk about ge genetics, which is about 60% neurobiological um, cycles of binging and purging may have an association with neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin and dopamine. Cognitive factors can include attachment challenges, especially with parents with younger, uh, or sorry, especially with parents when younger um, and with friends and relationships when older. Um, environmental factors, um, inter Internalization of thin body um, increases risk for weight worries, which increases that risk for bulimia. So let's put the nursing process into play here for They appear well, they're at or near ideal body weight. As you continue to assess, further observations will reveal physical and emotional problems. Physical signs um, may include large parotid glands, dental erosion, um, maybe even some caries because of that induced vomiting. Emotional and relationship signs that occur may be impulsivity, compulsivity. They may be chaotic, non-nurturing, familial or social instability, or difficulty with interpersonal relationships. Remember, again, we have to be self-aware um, as nurses on how we're feeling about our patient. Remember, the patient is sensitive to the perceptions of others regarding this illness, and they may feel shame and total loss of control if we're not careful with our self-awareness. We must show empathy as nurses, acceptance, and non-judgment. As far as assessment guidelines, this is going to include patient's perception of the problem or chief complaint, or again, we're going to perform a complete nursing assessment, including vital signs, system review, and appearance. We're going to gather that psychosocial history. We're going to assess our nutritional and fluid intake, assess daily activities, and review labs that might include electrolytes, glucose, thyroid function, CBC, and EKG. After our thorough assessment, we're going to prioritize our this patient population. Um, a lot of times their main concern is decreased cardiac output, 
due to their electrolyte and fluid imbalances. Other common priorities may be disturbed body image, ineffective coping, powerlessness, chronic self-esteem, and social isolation. Outcomes, again, should support that, those priorities. So we're gonna balance our electrolytes, we're gonna have adequate cardiac output, um, we're gonna have better body image, effective coping, all of those things that are listed there on your slide. As we plan and intervene, we want to place our patients on inpatient units designed to treat eating disorders. These units are structured um, to interrupt that destructive cycle and normalize those eating habits. The patient will also begin therapy for any underlying causes. They will be evaluated and treat those comorbidities. Counseling will be established for therapeutic alliance with the nurse. Health teaching will focus on meal planning, maintenance of healthy diet, and daily movement. As far as treatment modalities, um, biological treatments such as pharmacotherapy, Prozac, um, and SSRI antidepressant is really the only FDA approved medication for treatment of bulimia um, in our adult patients. Um, this drug can be helpful for people with bulimia, even in the absence of depressive symptoms. Normally, we use that for depression. We can use it for bulimia, even if they aren't depressed. Advanced practice interventions, um, CBT, we've talked quite a bit about. Um, again, that's being done by advanced practice registered nurse. Um, they're just restructuring those faulty perceptions and helping individuals develop accepting attitudes towards themselves. All right, binge eating engages in episodes of excessive eating after significant distress. They don't use the compensatory behaviors. Most of these patients are normal weight to overweight to sometimes obese, really dependent on how often these episodes are repeated. The DSM-5 criteria for binge eating includes recurrent episodes of binge eating, um, eating in a discrete period of time, sense of lack of control overeating during the episode, marked distressed over binge eating, so they eat, they eat, they eat, and then they're distressed about all that eating they just did, usually occurs at least one time a week for about three months and is not really associated with any other disorder. Episodes are associated with three or more of the following, eating more rapidly, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much you're eating, or maybe feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or very guilty afterward. So those are your DSM-5 criteria for diagnosis. As far as risk factors, um, genetics estimate about 41 to 57 percent, depending on the criteria that's used. Neurobiological factors include altered processing in that orbitofrontal cortex. Environmental factors, um, lots of social pressure to be thin. Um, those are usually typically influenced through media. It can tr trigger emotional eating. Uh, social weight stigma, which is stereotyping or discriminating based on a person's body is common in the US and perpetrates the cycle of binging. Other factors might include history of trauma, particularly emotional neglect, or a history of food insecurity, which is the result of not having reliable access to a sufficient quantity of nutritious and affordable food. So let's put our nursing process into chart. So we're gonna focus on um, assessment guidelines. So we're gonna look at, our, again, our patient's perception of the problem. We're gonna perform that complete nursing assessment with vital signs system review and appearance. We're gonna gather psychosocial history, assess our nutritional pattern, assess the history of weight cycling, and then assess and collect any history of binge eating triggers, foods, and how frequently is it happening. After a thorough assessment and data collection, um, we're gonna analyze it and our priorities will include impaired um, high nutritional intake, more than body requirements will be the big one, 
disturbed body image, risk for difficulty with coping, anxiety, powerlessness, risk for social isolation. Based off of the, our, our goals that we're going to set are going to be based off of those priorities, and you can see those documented there. We're going to plan and implement um, as far as planning. We're going to plan a balanced intake and healthy movement. Nurses must be aware of the verbiage that they use, avoid judgment language. Remember, binge eating is not about the food, but about coping with the emotion. Um, help patients track what events triggered the episode. Help patients explore community activities or groups. Use incremental approach and goal setting, and then do some health teaching and health promotion which again is gonna relate back to food and just getting them moving and exercising. After all interventions have been implemented, we're gonna evaluate and check to see that our outcomes have been met. Treatment modalities include biological, um, our, our pharmacotherapy. Um, while they seem to help in the SSRIs, while they seem to help in the short term, patients regain significant weight after stopping the medication. So some evidence has been found to support serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which are SNRIs, um, in treatment of patient with comorbid binge eating disorder and major depressive disorder. Other medications that are under investigation include TCAs and anti-epileptic agents. Um, Lisdexmethetamine, Vyvanse, is a stimulant used to treat attention deficit disorder um, has been seen to lower our relapse risk here. Um, as far as surgical interventions, we can think about bariatric surgery. This is very controversial as an option for the treatment of obesity. While all persons who are obese do not suffer from binge eating disorder, research has linked individuals with eating disorder that undergo this surgery to possible complications, such as impaired um, fasting glucose, high triglycerides, or urinary incontinence. Some other feeding disorders that I want to review really quickly are pica. Um, pica is eating non-food items well past toddlerhood. Um, it's really not part of any other illness. So kids eat dirt, paint, things that have no nutritional value. That's called pica. Sometimes people call it pica. I don't know how you really say it, pica. Uh, rumination is another one. This is regurgitation with rechewing, re-swallowing, or spitting out. There's really no medical or mental reason while, we, while some students ruminate. Children's Mercy actually has a rumination clinic, so it's that prevalent. So it's basically they eat um, and then undigested food returns back to the mouth. They either rechew it and re-swallow it or they spit it out. So it's just that ruminating over, again, over food. And then the last one here is avoidant or restrictive food intake. Usually starts in childhood. About 40% of our picky eaters usually resolve on their own. Most of these patients have a low BMI but they really don't have a distorted body image. They really just have a true lack of interest in eating. Um, so it's not, it's avoiding and restricting because they just aren't interested in eating. And that concludes chapter 18 on our, our feeding and eating disorders. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks guys.